when the Law Society of Upper Canada decided to sponsor a one-day workshop on basic problems in evidence, the response was somewhat larger than was anticipated, and the program was therefore subsequently repeated. The workshops took the form of a lecture followed by a panel discussion in each of the morning and afternoon sessions. The panel discussions were, however, a little out of the ordinary. They consisted of a number of short TV scenarios, each of them followed by a panel discussion examining the various evidentiary problems that arose. In the second workshop, the panels were switched around a little so as to give some variety in opposing views. Both sessions were recorded on videotape, and these programs are an edited version of the discussions of the evidentiary problems arising from the simulated courtroom scenarios. I do not think you will find many clear-cut answers to these fairly common problems. What you will find are discussions of some basic but extremely important principles from which solutions are suggested. This program is designed primarily for the legal profession, though we hope that others will be interested and will perhaps gain some insight into the workings of this aspect of the legal system and the way in which the law tries to reconcile conflicting interests. For the lawyers in particular, citations and references will be given for cases and materials mentioned, should they wish to make a note of them. There were, in total, four panels, of which two each discussed separately half of the fact situations. On the first day, chairing panel number one was the Honorable Mr. Justice Edson Haynes of the Supreme Court of Ontario. With him appeared Mr. William Poole, QC, practicing in London, Ontario, and a member of the Ontario Law Reform Commission, and Professor Hugh Silverman, QC, a practitioner of many years standing, and now Professor of Law at the University of Windsor. Chairing panel number two was the Honorable Mr. Justice Thomas Zuber, of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and with him were Mr. Clay Powell, QC, counsel in the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario, and Professor Desmond Morton, QC, who is both a practitioner and a law professor at the University of Toronto. Mr. Justice Zuber also chaired the first panel on the second day's program, and appearing with him on that occasion were Mr. Justice Frank Weatherston, of the Supreme Court of Ontario, and again, Professor Hugh Silverman. Mr. Justice Haynes chaired the last panel, again with Mr. Clay Powell and Professor Morton as the panelists. As a result of the editing, panel discussions do not always appear in the order in which they were presented. In the third fact situation, we look at the problem of proof of pain and suffering that so often depends upon a plaintiff's own statement when he appears as a witness in the witness box. But he may also previously have told his wife or children that he had a pain. Can he testify that he did in fact tell his wife or child? Can the wife testify that he did tell her that he had a pain? Furthermore, can she not only testify that he told her that he had a pain, but also go on and testify as to what he actually told her. Is there really a difference between stating that one has a pain and acting as though one were in pain? Is one hearsay, but the other not hearsay? Bear in mind also the dangers of allowing a party to create the illusion of there being more evidence than there actually is by repeating his story many times or by fabricating before trial evidence in his favor. Plaintiff complains that he can't work because of a whiplash type of injury. Yes, I did. Did you complain about these injuries to anyone? Yes, I did. In fact, I told my wife and two nephews, David and Gordon. Your Honor, that evidence is clearly inadmissible. Your Honor, I propose to call the wife and the two nephews. Thank you. As, by way of comment and introduction to this particular question, may I say that the evidence of lay witnesses 
as to utterances by an injured party is being offered more frequently in damage actions in our courts. And the theory is to indicate the state of mind of the victim. And I have observed it being done over and over again. And what counsel for the plaintiff is trying to get over is the fact that he'll call the doctor who is used to operations and blood and all the rest of it, and he's quite a cold witness so often. Or he might be forced to prove his case by way of medical reports, which is even worse. And that therefore, if he can put into the box real, live, flesh and blood witnesses who can talk about the pain and suffering of the individual, the damages are brought up into a reasonable field, and the jury understand it and compensate more readily. It's used, by the way, from and those who come from the Niagara Peninsula will understand when I say it's used a great deal by the members of the bar over there, and I think quite effectively. Now, Mr. Poole, what do you think of it? I think it's all wrong. <laughs> I don't think that... Uh, I don't think you can build up evidence by having your fellow go to the lawyer right away and the lawyer say, set out about the town complaining about your injuries so I can get a lot of witnesses to come in and tell the judge what you said. What's wrong with the lawyer saying keep a diary? Well, that's a different thing. But I think this, you can't get evidence in of a previous consistent statement. Uh, it's self-serving. Now, Oh, no, in... hold that a moment now. He lands in the hospital, he's semi-conscious, he's groaning with pain. Missable? No, 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 just a moment. Oh, no, hold it. No, no. Uh, yes or no? <laughs> Is admissible? The answer is yes. You see her? <laughs> now, he's home now and he's on crutches. And as he starts to walk, he's groaning with pain. And the blisters and so on that are on his leg, he t talks about that. The wife, the family see him and so on. Admissible? Well, you've missed the point. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to get very far with you, I see. Well, now, <laughs> here's my point on the thing. I don't think that you can let him build up evidence by planting a lot of stuff around to bring in witnesses. So oh, isn't that a matter of but, weight and uh, admissibility? Just, are you going to hear me? <laughs> but you can do it this way. In this case, uh, there's the wife and the two nephews. Why worry about what he said? Mr. Chairman, with respect, why would you be wasting your time on that? Just call the wife and the two nephews in and ask them on the witness stand, what did you see? That's the way to get around this. You don't need any utterance from him because it weakens his whole case. That's he might get drunk and leap like a hare. That <laughs> That's not the question. The question is, is his evidence admissible on these And points? I think not. And you say because it might be contrived. I, I say it's a previous consistent statement. You're building up, it's like me writing letters to somebody all the time and then coming in at the case and say he didn't object to them. Look at what a rogue he is. Is it your view then that it is not evidence as to his state of mind and his physical condition and that these are contemporaneous utterances with his suffering? Yes, the matter you of fact... You wouldn't recognize that rule. Matter of fact, the, the, the issue was decided in Jones versus the Southeastern and Chatham Railway in England in 1918, as I'm sure your lordship is most familiar, where, <laughs> where, where, the, where the issue was, how did she injure her hand? On the railroad or at home? And they wouldn't let her bring in evidence so that uh, of, of what she said at the time, because they didn't believe her. Naturally, she was going to say, like the workman's compensation was hurt in the railroad. No. But you could bring in evidence from her contemporaries to show that her hand was injured. But how could you get any evidence from her or anybody else saying, where it was injured apart from her evidence and the people who were eyewitnesses. That's aren't, the point. Aren't you, by your very answer, highlighting the point just made by Professor Mewitt, that if the evidence is admitted as to the mental and physical condition of the plaintiff, it is admissible, but not as to the cause thereof. And that's the case that you're talking about, and there are many like it. And it's the failure to distinguish the object for which it is being introduced. And I say that with great respect. What? 
<laughs> what you're really doing is using a case which says it's not admissible to show causation. I submit and suggest to you that it's really admissible to show contemporary utterances to show pain and suffering. What do you think, Professor uh, Silver? Uh, I, I have to agree with you. Uh, I certainly feel that <laughs> it's uh... <laughs> Now you know why. <laughs> now you know why I'm pleading insanity for being on this panel. I do think it uh, uh, does indicate a statement showing a state of his bodily health, and it is self-serving in that sense. And it uh, is, doesn't go in to prove the, the truth of any particular statement, but I think it's admissible to that extent. Now, you can have a prior consistent statement. There are certainly criminal cases, if one can analogize, where they've been put in, in the Phillips case in England, and it goes to the question of credibility or truth also. Uh, I'm thinking of that. That's a case involving incest, which uh, I'm sort of interested in. In any event, uh, uh, this statement may go in to indicate, the, as you've indicated, uh, uh, my lord, that uh, there is a particular state of bodily health, period. It doesn't prove any, anything more nor, nor less than that. That, right. that would be as far as I'd go. Incidentally, having said, Your Honor, I propose to call the wife and two nephews. If he does not call the wife and two nephews, assuming the evidence is admitted, over the objection of Mr. Poole. Then, if he doesn't call, is that subject to an adverse inference? Well, I wouldn't think so, because the statement goes in not to prove uh, the actual uh, truth of the statement, that he did make the complaint or not. I don't, I don't think anything well, could be said I'm thinking only of the trial technique aspects. He says in front of the jury, I'm going to call the wife and the two nephews, oh, if and he then doesn't he doesn't. Call. What's opposing counsel going to say to the jury? Well, whether the opposing counsel says anything or not, certainly the jury is going to remember that. So that as a matter of technique, you would agree that the evidence goes in, Mr. Poole, he certainly should call the wife and two nephews. Yes, sir, I do. I'm a little concerned about the suggestion of, you know, of using the, the term self-serving as being a a rule of general application by which evidence can be excluded. It's, it's such a loose and really ill-defined concept. Supposing Bill Poole sends his client out around the village to limp all over the place. Uh, can he then not call the villagers to say, we saw him walking around limping? And isn't that su as susceptible of being self-serving as what he says? If we're going to exclude things as self-serving, do we then exclude that kind of thing? I think probably that there's a sort of pragmatic, uh, common sense answer to that. They, 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 it's, it's much more tedious to limp around. <laughs> the, 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 the risk of uh, the garrulous fellow running around enjoying himself, telling everyone this story is much greater, it seems to me. And, I mean, if he's limping, he at least is putting some effort into it. But uh, uh, that, that, of course, would not be enough. I, I can't say I, 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 if I had a capacity to change the law in this area that I wouldn't change it to admit this sort of thing. But the, the cases seem to me to be absolutely clear that um, Cork and Cork, this absurdly named English case, uh, a m m wife and a, a, a lodger, typical English case, uh, are, are alleged to have committed adultery by a husband and a private detective who uh, keeping them under surveillance and knock at the door and say, ha ha, we have trapped you finally in the act of adultery and this is the end for you two down to the divorce courts. And uh, so the husband and private detective withdraw and then the, the wife and uh, lodger rush out into the driving rain, no doubt, to the nearest telephone box and telephone the wife's doctor and say, can you come down and examine us with a view to establishing that we have not recently had sexual intercourse. This must have been the oddest request the doctor had had in the middle of the night for some time, but uh, he, 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 he refused to come on the grounds that he had no scientific means that is ava available for making that determination. He could tell if they had had sexual intercourse, but not if they had not. Um, and um, so he refused to come, and uh, uh, they wanted to put that evidence in to show that their behavior was entirely consistent with innocence, that they entirely consistent with two people who were in an innocent situation and then had suffered this false accusation. 
And the English Court of Appeal said no. They weren't allowed to say that they phoned the doctor, and they weren't allowed to call the doctor to say that they was phoned. Now, I, I don't like that as a, a rule of law, but it appears to be a well-settled rule of law. All right, thank you. Frank, it, are there not cases in which people are allowed either to themselves say or call the, the hearer of the statement in which the nature of the statement relates to the state of bodily health of the declarant? You know, no, it's not very helpful simply to simply say this is a difficult problem, but um, it, it certainly is extremely difficult for plaintiff's counsel to prove his case if, if this rule against self-serving evidence is applied too strictly because uh, complaints here are entirely subjective. If you're going to exclude all evidence of complaints, how is the man going to build up any credibility? He, he simply stands in the witness, witness stand and says, I've got a sore neck, and as far as the jury are concerned, this is the first time he's ever said anything about it. And I think from a practical point of view, he's got to be allowed to put in evidence of complaints, not only to his doctor, but to other people. And, well, I, I, I don't know the law on this point. I see that Mr. Mewitt did deal with the matter this morning and said that you are entitled under the authorities to give evidence as to uh, bodily and mental conditions, and uh, <coughs> there are authorities there for admitting complaints of this type. I think it's, uh, it, it may be illogical, but it's practical and necessary that complaints be made as to these subjective complaints. All right, and, and may I just ask you this? Counsel for the plaintiff concludes by saying that, well, in any event, I, I propose to call the wife and two nephews. Does that really make any difference? No, I, I think it's wrong. No, I think the, the, the evidence uh, probably should come from the wife and two nephews. And it's always dangerous to give evidence, which in effect is premised on what these witnesses are going to say. They really should give their evidence first. But, uh, uh, I, I think that type of evidence should come from the, uh, the other witnesses, not from, not from the uh, injured person. Well, could, could I have your comments on a, on a statement like this, that if the nature of the problem is whether or not you can admit a complaint as to one's bodily health, does it really make any difference? If that's an exception to the hearsay rule, does it make any difference whether it comes from the mouth of the declarer or from the mouths of the hearer? And is it necessary to assure the court that you're going to call both the speaker and the listener? Can, can you do it any way you like? What do you think? Uh, uh, with, with, with respect, of course, I, I don't think that Mewitt's authorities do support the proposition that you can introduce evidence of a complaint as to mental or bodily feelings, either from the complainer or, or from the complainee. Uh, save where the person whose condition is being investigated has died before the trial. Every single one of those cases, the person whose physical condition is being investigated is not available at the trial to tell the court how he felt and what his bodily feelings were at all. So there's great necessity. You can only get it by discovering what he said while he was still alive. And in those cases, they have permitted the person to whom the complaint was made to come in and say what he said. As a primary requisite in every single one of those cases, the declarant, the man who suffered the injury, was dead at the time of the trial. Now, were he still alive, I can't see why counsel for the plaintiff here shouldn't have called the wife and two nephews and said to them, what's, uh, what's your husband's usual daily routine? And so he gets up in the morning, uh, goes to work and so forth, and established from or whether or not he followed that routine. Did he continue to go to work or did he lie in bed? Uh, was he, did he eat normally? What was his behavior? Was he irritable? Was he difficult with the children? Uh, did he go to the doctor? All those things can be established. They're far more important than did he complain of having a pain in the neck. Uh, similarly with the children, you could ask them factual details, and then you could ask the man, uh, did you go to the doctor? I mean. Uh, and ask him if he had a pain on his neck. I mean, not did he complain about it, but what, what did it feel like? Uh, I, I think it's very unfortunate to get into this business of, oh, he told me this and he told me that. I, I don't like it. You're punishing the, the honest man who pulls himself together and gets to work uh, and, and doesn't just lie around the house. Well, he's not going to get as much damage as is he? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a fairly, 
well, an almost universally accepted practice in Ontario to allow doctors, when testifying, to say that I first saw the patient on such and such a day, and he told me the following, gave me the following list of complaints. And uh, I then went on to do certain things and so forth. Uh, Professor Mio, or Prof I'm sorry, Professor Martin, uh, I, I, if, if these complaints are only admissible as emanating from the mouth of somebody who's now dead, uh, how, how, how do we justify this practice? I think the answer to that is to be found in the uh, uh, awareness by the courts now that all psychiatric examinations depend on question no, 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 and answer. No, no, not, not psychiatric, but, uh, straight medical. The doctor says the man come in and told me he hurt here, there, and everywhere, and I x-rayed him and so on. The, the awareness by the courts that psychiatric examinations are almost exclusively verbal has brought an awareness, I think, or as has brought to the surface an awareness which is always there that doctors have to ask patients questions about pain in order to diagnose their injury. That is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, a, an extraordinary situation. A doctor wants to find out if he has a pain there when he pokes him there, 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 there. It's part of his examination, the interrogation, and it's quite different from a casual conversation or a discussion. It's not a complaint in that sense, it's a response. Does it hurt when I poke you there? Do you sleep at night? Do you have pains in your eyes? These are all examination techniques. Well, I'd maybe go along with you when he says, do you hurt there when I poke you? But when he, when he says, do you sleep at night? And did you hurt three days ago? And so on. How, how is that part of the examination? Isn't he really t taking simply the complaints? Well, I think you're dealing with an expert witness. And one of the tools of his trade is interrogation. That's, that would be my answer. Oh, I know, I know. Frank, do you have anything? No, there? I don't agree with that. <laughs> I, I, I like Mr. Uh, Newitt's argument there that, that all you're doing is laying a factual foundation for the professional opinion. And, and uh, technically, that uh, what the man said to the doctor is not evidence of truth of the facts. It's evidence of facts in which the doctor bases his professional opinion. Now, the fact of the matter is you get it in front of the jury. It doesn't matter the basis that it goes in on it. I think, I think technically, uh, the mere, uh, apart from what I said just a few moments ago, the complaints that he makes to the doctor are, are merely the factual foundation on which the doctor bases his subsequent professional opinion.